your loved one yeah. or your, your relative. So we're going to talk about this subject this morning, the subject of overcoming fear. And the title of this message is, Oh My Soul, Don't Be Afraid, Believe God. Yeah, that's right. And so we're going to really dive into this this morning. I'm excited about the story that we're going to share. But I think the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that fear is just a very common emotion that all of us experience. And it's something that I experience every week. And I might experience it at some level, you know, every day. And so uh, we live in a, you know, very dangerous world. And so it's just very normal for us to experience a threat. Right. And, and then have the emotion of fear because of the threat that we feel. Yeah, that anticipation of danger, that anticipation yeah. of pain. And it, we normally think of fear when we think about fear. We think of it as a negative thing. You know, in the English word fear, when we talk about fear, it's almost always something negative. Uh, but the Bible, uh, and the Bible does say, do not fear over 365 times. That's a lot. That's a lot of times in the scriptures that the Bible says, do not fear. But the same word that's used for fear in the Bible is used in a very broad sense. And it's not always a bad thing inherently to fear. For example, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is a good thing. And you can see that in Proverbs 9:10. Yeah. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And so, in fact, the Bible says that we should fear the Lord over 100 times. And so fear is something that we may always think of as negative, but there are usage of this word fear in the scriptures that remind us that there is a type of fear that we should have. Yeah, it's important for us to understand that we experience, uh, we live in a dangerous world because yes. of the fall of man. That's right. Before the fall of man and the sin, the world was not a dangerous place. Right. And so there wasn't any kind of fear, anything to fear other than the fear of the Lord. Right, which is a good fear. Which is a good fear. But because of the fall of man, we now live in this dangerous world, and the world and the people in the world, including ourselves, are broken. Mm. In fact, that makes all of us dangerous people. It does. Because we are broken. And it's a good thing for us to experience a measure of fear, like if we heard a tornado warning right now, which would be out of the ordinary, right. it'd really create some fear. Right, you know? what is happening? It'd be good for us to experience a measure of fear when we hear this warning that there's a threat or a danger because that fear will motivate us to take action to protect ourselves. Yeah. And so we should take those kind of fears very seriously when we experience them and then we take the necessary precautions that go along with those fears. It would be presumptuous for us to go, you know, I hear that tornado warning. I'm not going to take it seriously. Right. I would call that person a fool. Fool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that would do something like that. Yeah. And so, you know, there's many threats to our security. And uh, the most significant threat to our security as human beings is the threat that's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's a threat of eternal judgment. For our sin. That begins in Genesis and goes all the way to Revelation. Yeah. And it's repeated over and over again, this serious threat to, uh, as far as called eternal judgment for our sin. Mm -hmm. And this fear is not an unhealthy thing. No. This fear is a good thing. For just like the threat of hearing a tornado warning means we need to take protective measures and seek safety. In the same way, this threat in the scripture of eternal judgment is, is meant to motivate us to trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation yeah. so that we'll be protected from the eternal threat. The fear of the Lord should always motivate us as Christians to take his commands seriously mm -hmm. because if we don't take his commands seriously, there's always consequences that we will suffer right. as a result of not taking his commands seriously. Absolutely. So there's that in this broken world, there's a, there's a type of fear that is a good fear because we understand the problem of sin, the curse of sin on this world, the curse of sin in our lives, and we need to fear the Lord and, and to fear who he is. But as disciples of Jesus, we can also suffer from a type of fear that's not a good thing, right? I mean, have you ever experienced that kind of fear that is not good for your soul, that can get you spiraling and spinning about something that's not healthy? 
When we fear things that keep us from fulfilling our missions as disciples of Jesus, that's an unhealthy fear. The most notable fear of this type, of this flavor in the Bible, is the fear of man. And a lot of times the fear of man can become such a problem in someone's life, concerned about what someone else is thinking or saying about you, that it keeps you from fulfilling the mission of God on your life. It keeps you from doing what God has called you to do. And that's not a good kind of fear. But really, any kind of fear that keeps us from doing the will of God is not a good fear. It's for an us. unhealthy fear. It God is. wants us to overcome it in our lives and not be subject to it. I remember becoming a Christian, and when I became a Christian, I surrendered to preach the gospel shortly after, and I'm in high school, and I remember the fear of man being so strong, mm -hmm. thinking about, well, what's my family gonna think about this decision? Yeah. What are my friends at school gonna think about this decision? Mm -hmm. And that was an unhealthy fear because it was something I needed to face and overcome in order to fulfill my mission absolutely for Jesus Christ and so Jesus knew that his disciples would have to learn to overcome their fears if they were going to do his will and fulfill this incredible mission that he had given them I mean they are the first 12 guys that are called with this new message of the gospel to carry it to the ends of the earth right I mean can you imagine being the first 12 guys no. I mean that's amazing and so he knew that they were going to suffer from fear, fear of man, and other fears that would keep them from fulfilling their mission. And so that's why he wanted them to overcome their fears, and that's why we call this message, Oh my soul, don't be afraid, but believe in God. That's right. So if you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, would you open with us to Mark 4? That's where we're going to be this morning. That's where our text is, Mark 4, and we're going to be looking at 35 through 41. Now, while you open your Bible to that passage, before we share the story from God's Word, let me give you just a little bit of context about this particular passage. Jesus and his disciples were at the Sea of Galilee. That's where the base of ministry was for the primary portion of Jesus' ministry with those 12 guys was around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus had spent this particular day sharing parables with his disciples. And the parables were about what will happen when the gospel is shared with other people. That's one of the main themes that you can see running through the parables in Mark chapter 4. There's more than two, but I'm going to tell you not the whole parable, but give you two examples. I think you'll be familiar with these. One of them is the parable of the sower and the seed. Do you remember that parable and how the seed lands on different types of soil and what happens when the word of God is sown in a heart that's ready to accept it and the kind of fruit that it bears in that person's life? And so Jesus is teaching them this parable. And then another parable was about the kingdom of heaven and about the little bitty mustard seed, which represents just a little bit of faith and how just a little bit of faith can produce this incredible uh, growth for the kingdom of God. So here Jesus is, can you picture it? They're at the Sea of Galilee and he's talking to those disciples and he's teaching them through parables and he has this message that he wants them to learn and then so often as he does, he's not just going to teach them but they're going to illustrate this message. Yeah, he shows them through these parables the power of the gospel. If you guys will just go out and sow the gospel and present the gospel and preach the gospel, here's what will happen. It'll be like a mustard seed that grows into this incredible plant. Yeah. You know, there'll be people that will receive the gospel and produce a fruit that manifests itself a hundredfold. And so he gives them these instructions, and then it's time for show and tell. Uh huh. I mean, that's the way Jesus disciples. Yeah. I give you the instructions, and now let's go on a mission trip. Let's go on a mission trip. And he tells all the guys to get in the boat. And he knows where they're headed. He knows what's going to happen when they get there. They're going to sail across the Sea of Galilee. And when they get to the other side, they're going to find a group of people that are called, they're from Gadara. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so Gadarenes mm -hmm. was their, you know, formal name or nationality name. And they were Gentiles. Yeah. And so he gives them this message to the disciples on the power of the gospel. And now he says, okay, here we go. And they're going like, okay, where are we going? We're going in the boat. We're going over to Gadaria. And what Jesus also knew ahead of time is that when they got out of the boat, they were going to meet this guy who was possessed by demons. 
And he's called the Gadarean demoniac. Mm -hmm. And that's where our story begins. Yeah, because there's a significant event that happens on their way for Jesus to share the word and to lead his disciples to share the word with those people. And that's what our story is about this morning. So here we go, Mark 4, 35 through 41. Here's the word of the Lord. On that day, meaning after those parables were taught, when evening had come, he said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, with, they, they took him with them in a boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he, he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? So what did Jesus want his disciples to learn from the circumstances that would hope, help them overcome their fears in the future as they went out to fulfill his mission? Well, to overcome their fears, Jesus knew that his disciples had to believe these three things. The disciples of Jesus had to believe that he cares that God cares about them. The disciples of Jesus had to believe that God is sovereign. And the disciples of Jesus had to believe that he is faithful to do what he promises that he will do. Well, let's dive into this first thing that Jesus wanted his disciples to realize, and, and, uh, and that was that he cares. He does. Or that God cares. Mm -hmm. When we're going through these things that are creating unbelievable fear in our life, we need to believe that God cares. Notice in the passage of Scripture, it said the great storm. And so the great storm de de describes the magnitude of the severe weather that they were experiencing there upon the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. Once you understand the Sea of Galilee is not a sea like you think of it. It's like a large lake. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than Lake Hefner, okay? But it's more like Lake Hefner than it is the ocean, mm -hmm. all right? And so it's in the bottom of these, this uh, valley, which is surrounded by hills and mountains on all the, all the sides of it. And so it was, un it was very common when fishermen were out fishing for some great storm to come up that was remarkable. That's the word great. It was remarkable. It was unusual. It was out of the ordinary. And so, the, you know, Jesus had disciples that were experienced fishermen. And so they knew all about these storms. And they had seen firsthand what these storms had done to other fishermen and their boats who got caught up in these storms. And so as a result, because of their past experiences as fishermen, they were terrified. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting when, when the fishermen are terrified, everybody's terrified. Absolutely. You know, I imagine Matthew, the text collector, you know, he's sitting there going, I've never been in this before. Uh -huh. And they're, they're terrified. I'm terrified. Right. right. So they're scared to death. And they thought that they were all going to die in this storm. And there were other people in boats that were with them. And they thought, all oh, these folks are going to die too. Here we are. We're taking a trip over to see somewhere where Jesus wanted us to go. We're all going to die. Yeah. And while all this is going on, what's Jesus doing? He's asleep in the boat. He's just having a nap. You know, he's exhausted from ministry. You can read some chapters before and, you know, his ministry was very tiring. But he was at perfect peace, just asleep in the boat while these disciples had this great fear going on because of the great storm that had come upon them. And so they finally decided to wake up Jesus. And when they woke him up, uh, they asked him a rhetorical question. Yeah. And what the rhetorical question uh, reveals is that they were accusing him of not caring about what happened to them because this is what he said. They said, they said to Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing? When we go through storms in our life, 
we can feel like these disciples felt. The storms can get so severe and our fear can start to grip our souls in such a way that we can ask a similar kind of question to the Lord in our souls. Do you not care, Jesus? Do you not care? Are you not paying attention to us? Do you not care that we are perishing? I can't tell you the number of times that I've been in that place. And I've asked that question. Lord, do you even care mm -hmm. that I'm going through this mm -hmm. right now? And until I believe that, that he does care, right. I'm not going to overcome fear mm. of whatever is coming next in my life. Mm -hmm. So we have to come to a point where we resolve in our own mind, even though it doesn't seem like it because of the circumstance, he really does care. Yes. He really does care. Uh, we must believe that our welfare is always on his mind. Now, in this story, Jesus was asleep at the wheel, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, he was a human being. But, you know, the Bible tells us that God never sleeps and he never slumbers. Yeah. So Jesus is done sleeping since he rose from the dead, <laughs> right? And he constantly is watching over each one of us that know him, each one of us that are his children. Yeah. And the Bible even tells us in the Old Testament that like we are the apple of his eye. Yeah. When, when you say that to someone, you're telling them, I always care about you. Yeah. I, you know, there's never a time where I don't care about you. There's nothing more important to you. Yeah. You always have my attention. One of my favorite greetings that we have in the history of this church yeah. is Ben Manus. When he gets up here every time, he yes. says, sons and daughters of the Most High God, good morning. Good morning. Hey, yeah, there yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. Some of you have that history. And we would always enthusiastically answer, good morning. And that's just a reminder that he cares about us. We're his kids. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we all know, those of us who have children, how much we care about our own children. Yeah. And we don't think about them like every moment of every day, but we think about them every day. Right. And probably many times a day. Yeah. But God, we are constantly the focus of his attention. Wow. He has the divine ability to make each one of us the, the focus of his attention 24-7 in our lives. Yeah. And that's incredible when you think about it. And so if we're going to... Uh, really overcome fear we've got to believe that he cares yeah so i want you to start this way when you're going through the storms of this life the temptation is going to be that jesus does not care yeah that god does not care about you and despite what you may feel i want you to believe this that jesus always cares about you. God always cares about you. And the first step to overcoming fear is believing this truth that he cares for you. To overcome their fears, Jesus knew the disciples had to believe that he cares, but he also knew that the disciples had to believe that he is sovereign. These two go together so importantly. You can't separate them and overcome fear. We believe he cares, but we also have to believe that he is sovereign. The word sovereign means ruler. It's talking about this divine attribute of God that he is the supreme ruler, that he is in control of all things, that there is nothing outside his power. And the disciples of Jesus knew that Jehovah God, Yahweh, is the ruler over all things. They knew that. They were yeah. Jewish men. They had the scriptures, and they knew that, and they, they knew that that included the weather, and being the ruler over the weather in this particular time in history and in this particular culture was like the pinnacle of deity, right? Like anyone who could control the weather was definitely God. And the disciples had this view that Jehovah could control all things, including the weather. And they knew the stories of Noah and Moses and Jonah and Elijah and all the ways that God through these different figures had proven his power in history by controlling the weather. And they also knew passages like Psalm 89.9. Psalm 89.9 says, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Talking about Jehovah, talking about Yahweh. So they had this picture of God. They yeah. knew what he was like. Yeah. So they had this knowledge of God. They knew this fact about God, but in this moment, it wasn't real to them. Mm -hmm. 
And we can find ourselves in that same place when we deal with fear. Yeah. We can question whether or not God cares. And then we can question whether or not, even though we know it, whether or not he's really sovereign, mm-hmm. ruler over the circumstances that we are experiencing. And so it has to become real to us yeah. in order for us to overcome fear. It just can't be a, a part of our head knowledge. Right. It's got to be true to us in our heart. And, and we know it wasn't real to them because they were terrified. Yeah. And not only were they terrified, not one of them said, you know, Jehovah is the ruler of the storm. Right. Let's just pray to him right now. Right. And maybe he'll calm this storm for us. Nobody prayed. No. I mean, they knew God was sovereign in their minds, but it wasn't real to them in their hearts. And so what did they do? They turned to someone they knew and respected for their faith, Jesus. Yeah. And they woke him up. Yeah. And they woke him up, and what Jesus did is that he just immediately stood up, and he did what Jehovah does. Right, because he is God. Because he is God. He rebuked this great storm, and immediately, the Bible says, there was this great calm. Yeah. I mean, immediately, when he rebuked the storm. And so, when Jesus did that, he reminded all of these disciples that Jehovah was sovereign mm. over even the weather and everything else. And then he did something else, though. When he did it, he demonstrated that he was Jehovah. Yeah. I mean, he had revealed to them that he was God. But they weren't yet at the point of faith in their hearts to really believe it. Right. Well, this was really showing off. Yeah, it was. That he was Jehovah God. And so what it did, it caused those disciples to have a great, what, fear. Mm -hmm. And a great fear and also a great faith in his sovereignty. And so when they saw his power over the weather, their fear for the great storm was displaced by what? A great fear of him. Yeah. And his sovereignty over all. Yeah. It must have been an incredible moment. Oh, man. I just think there had to be an awkward silence. Yeah, yeah. You know, when that happened. It was well, like, whoa, then, you know, and he is sovereign. They're just standing there. Who is this? Yeah. That even the wind and the seas obey him. Um, man, that, that shift in the object of their fear from the weather to him demonstrates that they got it. They got they it. They understood his sovereignty. And to overcome fear, we must believe that God cares about us, but that's not enough. If he's not powerful, his care for me isn't enough to overcome fear. I have to believe that he cares about me and that he is sovereign, that he is the ruler over all things, the supreme ruler of heaven and earth. Do you believe that nothing can happen to you unless God allows it? That's a challenging question. Do you believe that nothing can happen to you unless God allows it? Well, if he cares for you deeply and nothing can happen to you unless he allows it, then we can agree with the psalmist and we can say things like, well, then what will I fear? What can man do to me? Yeah. Because God is on my side. The Lord is my salvation and my strength. He is my refuge and my hope. He's my strong and mighty tower. I will not be afraid because he cares about me and he controls it all. Do you see how powerful those two things are together when it comes to overcoming fear? One is not enough. You have to believe them both, that he cares deeply for you and that he is sovereign and in control over all things. Jesus proved to his disciples that he was sovereign by rebuking the storm. And he's proven to all of us that he is sovereign because by his own power, by the power of God, he is raised from the dead. And he has demonstrated his sovereignty because even death itself could not defeat him. And we find power to overcome fear when we believe in his complete control and that he cares about us. So his death for us proved that he cares for all of us because the Bible says that Jesus died not just for your sins and not just for my sins, but it says for the sins of the world. The whole world. Yeah. And we also know that the Bible says it's not his will for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Yeah. And so we know he cares about everyone the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we know he is sovereign because death couldn't defeat him. Yeah. This storm couldn't defeat him. No. You know, he was, he's ruler over all things, including death. 
And so we've learned to overcome our fears. Uh, Jesus knew that his disciples had to believe that he cared. They had to believe that he was sovereign. But there's one more thing, and you sort of jumped the gun. Did I? Yes, you did. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> you have to believe that he is faithful to fulfill what he promises to do. Yeah, he will. You couldn't wait. You just had I to could. get into the promises. It was just right there. I know, I know. <laughs> and he, we got to believe that. We got to believe that he's faithful to what he has promised to do. Yeah. So, you know, after Jesus rebuked the storm, he then turns around, everything's calm, it's an awkward silence. And what does he do? He rebukes his disciples. Yeah. He rebukes the storm, then he rebukes his disciples. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Mm -hmm. Have you still no faith? You know, at first, to me, that's sort of irrational. You know, if you think about it. Yeah. Him rebuking them for being afraid. Yeah. It's like... Seems a little harsh. A little harsh to me, you know, yeah. like this great storm that's out of the ordinary and unusual, and we're not supposed to be afraid. Right. You know? And so at first, it might appear that his, his rebuke is misplaced or it's too harsh. And, but because it's natural for all of us to fear when we experience storms in our life. And, 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 and it's not wrong for us to fear. When there's storms in our life. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, there was something those disciples had missed. What was it? Yeah, what the disciples were missing that caused uh, them, what were, it was it that the disciples were missing that caused them to not believe or to, to <laughs> sorry, what were the disciples missing that caused Jesus to rebuke them for their unbelief? What was it that caused them to, him to rebuke them that way? Well, what they were missing was faith in his words that he had spoken to them when he left on the trip. Do you guys remember what he said? At the very beginning of the passage, he gave them a promise. And what this did is he what say? He said. What was the promise that he gave them? We're going across. We're going to the other side. Said, Jesus had already spoken. Let us go to the other side. Let, the, let us go to the other side. They, he had already spoken, and he had said, we're going to the other side. And so their fear wasn't wrong because they feared the severe weather. That wasn't the issue. Their fear was wrong because yeah. they did not have faith in the specific promise that Jesus had given him. He had said, we are going to the other side. So one of the disciples could have provided great leadership in this moment right? They could have really provided some strong leadership. The waves are, are rising Pounding up. Down, the storm's going. The boat is filling with water. And one of the disciples could have said, hey guys, hang on, calm down. Look, he, he's sleeping. Jesus is not worried about this. We shouldn't be worried about this. He told us we're going to the other side. So we're going to the other side. One of them could have provided incredible leadership in faith by standing on the promise that they had already f received from Jesus by believing that what he said, would happen was going to happen. It's going to happen. And so they did not believe it, and that's why they were afraid. So to overcome fear in our situations, in our circumstances, we must believe that God is absolutely faithful to everything that He's promised yeah. will happen. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's great to believe that He cares, and it's great to believe that He's sovereign. Those are foundational, yeah. but then we've got to believe in the promises of God. And, you know, the Word of God is, is so wonderful in that it's just filled with all of these promises that apply to the specific circumstances and situation yeah. in our life. And, and so, for example, when we lack resources, you know, like inflation's going up and you know, or something happens in which we have to use uh, resources for this, and now we can't pay this, and, and we're lacking resources. There's a promise in the Word of God that we should stand on. Mm. And that promise is, Jesus said to his disciples, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto us. In Psalm 37, 25, this is one of your Uncle Cecil's uh, great uncle Cecil's favorite verses. He said it all the time. He said, I'm young and I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Yeah. So there's a promise from God when we are lacking resources. Yeah. 
His, his word is full of promises. When we face an uncertain future, the word of God promises. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Isn't that a great one? Yeah. I mean, come on. When we have an uncertain future, we need that promise that we can hang on from the Word of God. When we face suffering of any kind, this is one of my favorite Psalms. It says this, Psalm 46, 1 through 5. God, God is our refuge. God is our strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will, will not, not fear. fear. We will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Oh, man, what a promise from God's word when we're suffering in any way. And then when we face death, you know you should not fear death. Did you know that? That you should not be afraid of death? That makes us different than the rest of people in the world. We are not afraid of death because of the promises of God. Because we know He cares for us and that He has the power to bring about these promises in our lives. Death won't defeat us. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall Amen. live. And 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. We don't fear death because of the promises of God. So when our death is approaching, we shouldn't be afraid of death because of these promises, because we know God cares and he's sovereign. But what about when one of our loved ones hmm. is facing death? Hmm. Is there a promise from God's word for that? Well, yes, and you, most of you all know it. It's found in Psalm 23. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When you're getting ready to lose a loved one who's getting ready to pass away, I want you to know those words are so comforting. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm losing somebody that I deeply love, but I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow. Amen and amen. Yeah, we find peace instead of fear because of the promises of God's word and because he cares, yeah. because he's sovereign to bring these about. And then what about when you're afraid and you don't believe that you have what it takes? You know, this one hits me a lot. This one's personal for me. You know, sometimes you, you go through a storm or yeah. another storm, and then sometimes you go through a great storm like these out of the ordinary, unusual, or it's wave after wave after wave, or it just feels like the water's already filling the boat, yeah. is what the story said for these disciples. What about when we don't feel like we have what, what it, it takes. takes to overcome the storms in our life? Well, God promises in Isaiah 40, 28 through 31, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary, and his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strength to him. Even you shall grow tired and weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. And Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. To overcome fear in our souls, we must believe that God is faithful to do what he promises to do, that he cares about us, that he is sovereign, and that he is faithful to do what he promises to do. We need to learn the promise of, uh, promises of God, and we must believe that he will always do whatever he promises that he will do. And these are just a few of the promises yeah. that we've read this morning. There's so many more 
that you, I would encourage you to learn the promises, learn where they're at in the scripture so you can go to them when you need them. It, you know, it would even be better if you would memorize them and, and, and put them into your heart and into your mind so that you can call up these promises when you need them. You know, we have the best counselor in the world. His name is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Why don't we run to him? Yeah. Why don't we use the word of God the way we're supposed to use the word of God? Believing that God cares, believing that he is sovereign, and believing that he has specific promises just for us. Yeah. We could save ourselves a lot of money yeah. if we would run to him mm -hmm. and seek this from him when we are in these situations where we're being overwhelmed with fear. Truly, truly. Jesus is enough. He is enough. And what he has provided for each one of us mm. is enough for each one of us. So here Jesus is training these disciples, and he knew this was just a minor trial mm. to what they were going to face in the future after he was risen from the dead. And he wanted them to, you know, learn how to overcome the great fears that they were going to struggle with in their life. He knew what was going to happen. He knew this because when we're afraid, what does Satan want to do? He doesn't want us to extend the kingdom of God. No. He wants to stop us from extending the kingdom of God and preaching yeah. the gospel of Jesus Christ and discipling others. So Satan wants to use fear to enslave us, mm -hmm. he, to bring us into bondage. He, and the reason he wants that is real simple. He, he's not trying to drag us down to hell with him. Our eternal security is secure. Yeah. What he's trying to do is deter us from our mission. Right. And keep us from being a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So Jesus knew that his disciples must have this incredible faith yeah. in him. If they were going to fulfill their mission, yeah. that he cared, that he is sovereign, and that he is faithful to do what he promised to do. So let us ask this question as we are reaching the end of this this morning. What storm are you experiencing right now at this moment that you would be honest? You would say, yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with some fear yeah. because of this storm. What would it be for you? Yeah, I can be, I can be honest. Um, a lot of you know that we're taking care of three kids right now, which is totally new for us and was unexpected. And, and initially, whenever we found out that DHS was going to place three kids with us, my initial fears were about... Will we have enough money? How will this impact our family? How will my kids, my, my own kids, respond to three new kids joining our family? Uh, you know, all these questions of the unknown were initially what was causing fear, but there's been some shift for me in those fears. I mean, those are still there at times, but just a couple nights ago, I had a dream, and in that dream, it was a dream about the kids leaving our house. And the emotions became really real to me hmm. about the heartstrings that we've already started tying with these kids and how much we love them and how much that's going to hurt mm -hmm. when the time comes, you know, because the goal right now is to see them back with mom. That's the goal. And she's in rehab and you can pray for Amy. Uh, she's over 30 days now in rehab. She's doing great on the start, but this is just the start. This is a long road for her to be in the right place. So I have all the fears. I have the fear of, well, what if they go back and then it ends up not being right? And what if they have to go through more suffering, you know, because it ends up not being, she's not ready for them. Or what if she gets ready and they go back, but then she doesn't want to be part of our lives anymore. And now all these relationships we've built and this, these heartstrings we've tied with the kids, those all get cut and the pain of that those are some real fears. And when I woke up from that dream, what I realized, and it's interesting that it happens this week preparing for this message, is I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the future. I'm afraid of the unknown. I'm afraid of the pain that could come uh, from those things. And, and so whenever I'm afraid like that, that's, that's it for me. That's the one uh, whenever that question is asked. What, are, what storm are you experiencing right now that's causing you fear? That's the biggest one. And when I think about that, you know, I've, I've been intentional this week. It's, it's been challenging this weekend, but I've really prayed about this message. And I just felt like, Lord, this is what you want for your people Absolutely. because it's brought peace to me. 
Because yeah. I started thinking, God, no matter what we face or what we go through, you care about us and you care about these kids. Yeah. And you are sovereign over all things. There's not, it's so outside my control. I've learned it being in DHS and, and then these are uh, kids that are Native American tribal uh, kids that are involved with the tribes. And there's, there's so much outside our control because of the different powers at play. But trusting God, you are powerful over them all that you are sovereign over them all. And then your promises are sufficient for me. And that when I grow weary or when I, I, that's the one that I mentioned to you just a minute ago, when I'm growing weary or I'm getting tired, when I feel like I don't have what it takes, you know, and I want to give up, God, you are my strength. You are the one who fills me up. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And in those moments, if I'll run to him in prayer like that, it's amazing how his love cast out fear. Yeah, it's amazing right. how I'm no longer a slave to those thoughts and those fears, but I start to overcome them, not because of who I am or what I have, but because of who he is and his promises in my life. So that one's really real for us right now in an area where lot. I'm facing fear. Yeah, that's a lot. For us, two weeks ago, I preached here on, oh my soul, don't grieve without hope. And that afternoon after lunch, Sandra and I are driving home, and I get a call from my daughter, Mercy, from Virginia, and she said, my daughter, Grace, is, who lives in Wellston, was on her way to the emergency room in Edmond at mm -hmm. Mercy Emergency because she was having these level 10 abdominal pains that had started that morning. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I go up to the hospital to be with her. She's driven herself to the hospital, uh, and I go up there to be with her and they start running the test and they do the ultrasound and then they do the CT scan and the doctor comes in and he basically at this point is sort of inconclusive in what's going on but he says it is in her ovaries and immediately I experience fear because her mother passed away from ovarian cancer and, uh, and she experiences it too the moment he says it's the ovaries. Mm -hmm. You know, we were hoping maybe it was appendix mm -hmm. or something else going on. No, it's the ovaries. And, uh, and so he says, you know, we're sort of inconclusive on what's going on there, but you need to see your gynecologist next week. And so she goes in two days later and sees her gynecologist, and the gynecologist does a CA-125 test, which CA stands for cancer antigen, to measure the, me the amount of cancer antigen in her blood. And the normal cancer antigen in a woman's blood is somewhere below 35. And, uh, and so, but hers came back 24 hours later at 400. Mm -hmm. And immediately, her gynecologist refers her to the OU Medical Cancer Center to see an oncologist there. Mm -hmm. And so we had our first appointment. I went with her to the first appointment last Monday and met with the oncologist and the oncologist uh, wants to perform surgery uh, right away because the only way they can accurately diagnose whether or not it is ovarian cancer or not is by doing surgery, either doing biopsies or doing a hysterectomy and then doing biopsies mm -hmm. because they can't tell until they look at it under a microscope eventually right. what it is. And so she's scheduled to have surgery this uh, a week from tomorrow mm -hmm. on Monday we will go down and she will have that surgery done. And so that's the latest storm. And it happened right after I was preaching this sermon on, oh, my soul, don't grieve without hope. Mm -hmm. And immediately this happened. And so the kind of fears that I've dealt with as a result of that is, first of all, it, it's just the fear of grace going through the same suffering that her mother went through. Yeah. Because just can't help but think about that, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then there's the fear of our family going through that suffering with her. And we don't even have a diagnosis yet. Right, yeah. You know? But it's just because of what we've experienced that we're having those fears. And then the fear of, of pain, the fear of the pain of having the same outcome mm -hmm. that we had before, mm -hmm. which is an incredible, devastating pain that I can't even explain mm -hmm. how emotionally hard that is. And then there's the fear of the pain of being separated from my granddaughters if we got the same outcome mm -hmm. because Jake's family lives in New York mm -hmm. and who knows what can happen to your grandchildren if you lose that connection mm -hmm. and then there's the fear of what my grandchildren will suffer now and in their future if they lose their mother mm -hmm. 
Wow, that's a lot of fear, isn't it? You know, <laughs> what do you do? Well, you believe that God cares. Mm-hmm. That's what you do. Mm-hmm. You know, this is not an accident. Mm-hmm. He cares. He didn't suddenly look away and this happened to you. Mm-hmm. He is sovereign. And then what do you believe? You believe the promises of God yeah. that are in his word mm-hmm. for grace. I believe the promises of God for her. I believe the promises of God for me. I believe the promises of God for my family. Mm -hmm. And we began to cling to those promises. And what happens when you believe that God cares, that he's sovereign, and you begin to put your hope in his promises? Peace of God is what you experience. And you defeat fear. And so I'm able to stand before you this morning, continue my mission. Yeah. I was able to preach a funeral yesterday and continue my mission. Yeah. And the reason I can continue is because I know he cares. Yeah. I know he's sovereign. And I know he will fulfill what he's promised to do. That's right. The Amen. question is. Amen. The question is, do you know this? Yeah. Do you know this? And we don't want you to leave here this morning. No. Without that kind of faith. Yeah. That kind of faith. Yeah. So Brandon Warner, go ahead. Share with them what they need to do. Well, listen first. You need to believe that God is just. And that if you are still under the judgment of God for your sin, that he does not have favor towards you. And you need to fear the judgment and the wrath of God that is coming on this world because of sin. And if you don't know Jesus, you should be very afraid of God's judgment. But that kind of fear should be a good motivator for you. Because the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God loves us and he has made us a way for us to escape his judgment and his wrath that is coming upon this world. And the scripture teaches us that if you will turn to Jesus and believe on him for the forgiveness of your sins, that he will make you right with God so that his favor will shine upon you, so that you no longer have to fear his judgment, so that you no longer have to fear his condemnation and his wrath towards sin, but you can rest as a child of God, sons and daughters of the most high God. And so I want to encourage you first and foremost this morning that if you're here and you're listening to my voice and you don't know Jesus, let me just dispel the lie that his favor is upon you if you are apart from him. His wrath is upon you. And I want to encourage you to turn to God and repent. And when you repent, to believe that he cares about you and his favor will come upon you because of his grace. And he will deliver you from sin and he will deliver you from his wrath towards sin. So I wonder right now if you would just bow with me in prayer. And if there's anyone here this morning who knows I need to come to God and put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I need to believe on him for the forgiveness of my sins. And perhaps God wants to use a fear of him this morning to lead you to repentance, to lead you to faith in him and to turn from your own way and to turn from your sin and to put your faith in Jesus. And I wonder right now, is there anyone here this morning who says, that's me with our heads bowed and eyes closed? Is there anyone who's saying, I haven't been believing on Jesus and starting right now, I wanna believe on Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. I'm turning to him. I'm turning away from my sin. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me this morning? God is doing that work in my heart. All right, now look up at me. If you're a disciple of Jesus this morning, What fear, what storm are you facing that our enemy wants to use to produce fear in your heart? So often one of our greatest problems with fear is that we just never even face it in the first place. We won't even acknowledge the things that are causing us fear. And I want you to know in my situation that I shared with you a moment ago, there's been a few times recently where I was going to make some rash decisions because of fear where I started thinking, I'm gonna take some action in this area, and it was all about self-preservation, it wasn't about love. 
And the scripture says that perfect love casts out fear. And when we can rest in the love of God towards us, disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, when you will rest in the love of God for you and believe that he cares about you, it's the first step to overcoming fear in your life. But him being caring towards you is not enough. When you believe in his sovereignty, that he has power over the storms in your life, you put those two things together and you start to really experience freedom from fear. And then you trust the Lord and his promises towards you and what he says about you and what he says about your circumstances and his faithfulness to you in those circumstances. And what can man do to me? Why would I be afraid? So disciples of Jesus, Will you face the fears that are in your heart this morning? Will you acknowledge those to the Lord? And then will you make the conscious choice to believe that He cares about you, that He's sovereign over those situations, and that His promises are sure? I want to give you an opportunity right now to start that process. Would you bow in prayer with me? And would you just go to the Lord right now, face your fear? What is it in your life that is causing you to be afraid? Don't be afraid. Believe in God. Just tell the Lord right now, God, I know you care for me. Will you do that in your heart right now? God, I know you care for me. Then tell him, God, I know that you are bigger than this storm that I am facing. And that you are right here with me in the storm. And then ask the Lord to help you. God, what are the promises from your word that you want me to believe that apply to the situation that I'm facing right now? Show me those promises. And now you can look up at me. And when it comes to those promises, this is my last encouragement to you this morning, is that you need to fill your mind with God's truth. If you don't have those promises memorized, if you don't know what the Word of God says, you can't anchor your soul right now in the promises of God. So you need to daily seek Him in His Word. You need to seek Him by coming and being a part of church services where the promises of God and the Word of God is preached. And you need to seek Him every day through relationships with the people in your small group. Be transparent about your fears and then trust that the Lord is going to speak to you through the members of that group and tell you about his promises so that you can anchor your soul in the promises of God. So will you do that? Will you seek out the truth of God's word and the promises that he wants you to believe? Well, will you stand with me as we close out this service and we're going to sing a wonderful song that is gonna help us to trust more in God and in his promises. And as we sing this song, I don't know what the storm is you're going through, but I just wanna encourage you, release it to the Lord. Believe that he cares, believe he's sovereign and believe in his promises.